Okay. Um, yeah. Good morning, everybody. It's early in the morning. I know everyone has partied lot, not, uh, last night, I think. Um, yeah. Today I want to talk a little bit about remote yacht hacking. So, um, about some attacks and some uh, issues that I found on uh, maritime stuff. And yeah, we will have some fun together, I think. Um, my clicker is not working. Ah, here we are. Should watching the movie, I think. Uh, yeah, that was 1995. They give already suggestions about what could happen. So they hacked the balance system of a uh, big ship there, and um, that was 1995. Now we have uh, 19, 2019, and uh, we will see actually such kind of attacks more and more happen. Maybe, um, yeah. Um, what I'm talking today is a short overview about uh, Maritime 101, uh, router and SATCOM vulnerabilities, uh, autonomous ships and some Q&A if we have time enough. Um, why hacking yachts? Maybe someone have an idea about that? Why not? Why not? That's a good answer. <laughs> yeah, why hacking yachts? They are mostly privacy owned, uh, privately owned. Um, and um, CEOs or people who have big money uh, doing their job on board um, and when you have access over the satellite uh, internet connection or the modem over Wi-Fi or whatever you maybe have the option to get some information that should not be outside there um, or another one uh, could be also celebrities on their ships when you have act uh, access to the multimedia devices, uh, all those smart TVs on board, you maybe get some pictures that um, some others not have. Um, yeah, that's the two things um, why privately owned uh, yachts mostly are attacked. Um, yeah, several uh, celebrities I also said. And um, as I already mentioned, if we have access over the internet connection, we can do whatever we want. My name is Stefan Gerling. Uh, you can also find me on the OB1666 on Twitter. Um, I'm older than the internet. Quite old now. Uh, no, not really. Uh, a couple of certifications I have. GCFA, CISSP, MCSE, uh, you name it. I'm an electronic specialist um, from the past, doing now uh, IT security stuff. Um, I joined the Army a couple of years um, and doing their navigation systems, maintenance for helicopters. Um, by the way, I'm also a firefighter, volunteering firefighter since 31 years now. Um, I'm working in the oil and gas industry for my employer Rosen, so we're doing pipeline inspection, that's our main business, but also focusing now more and more on uh, yachts. Um, that's why the company certification is here on my slides, um, so that's another branch of our company. Um, yes, I void warranties, I buy stuff, looking how it is working, then I open it and to see what's in there. Um, and I'm volunteering uh, Geraffel, I'm the cavalry and also DEFCON. Um, as you've seen, I'm just on duty. Um, I just come for my shift here and now there. Yeah, how it is started. Um, there were a couple of news about hacking yachts in the, in the past. So the Marine had some accidents uh, a couple of years ago, uh, 2017. So they um, had four accidents with their ships and uh, also some other things. Uh, that hackers um, owning an yacht or 
cybercrime on the high sea uh, and so on. So that were some information that you find there. So this is also then one of the news uh, that was really interesting. So when we looked then at the schedule there, the US Navy had 2017 four accidents with their uh, warships. And then you tr uh, try to figure out, so why the fuck they have four accidents with their ships? Uh, they should know about navigation very good, but it happens at that time. So the rumors come up that um, somehow their ships were um, maybe hacked, but um, I've read two of those um, reports after that. Um, it turns out that it was more or less an, a human error navigation pr uh, failure, so people at night uh, were not really uh, well trained doing their own, uh, they're doing the navigation at night alone, uh, so it was somehow a human error. So they did not follow the, the, uh, the good guidelines for that. And uh, last year also there was an, a Norwegian frigate. So during, during the military exercises uh, in the NATO, they had uh, also an accident with that. Um, yeah. So this was a couple of pictures from the frigate. So it uh, crashed into another vessel and uh, here you see it has now 45 degree uh, on, the uh, on the side. Um, when you maybe remember the pictures, um, this was the, um, the vessel that crashed in it or, or the frigate crashed in that. And this picture was shown. Uh, if you could see here maybe, here are some scratches. So the first thing that you'd maybe think about this is the free gate crashed into the side here, but uh, it fit not uh, with the, the things that you see here. So also open source intelligence uh, will help a little bit. So I looked up on marinetraffic.com, there you find pictures with the same dents and scratches, and w when you look at the Data of the date of the pictures, it turns out that the picture was taken half a year before the crash happened. So those uh, uh, the marks are not fitting together. So just uh, only a quick thing about uh, some pictures that shown in the news. Yeah, vessel, yachts, and ships. A yacht is more or less a recreational ship, and the term comes from the Dutch uh, marine. So. The Dutch had some uh, very fast, small vessels um, for hunting pirates in the shallow waters uh, in the past. So, and uh, yacht, uh, yacht, yacht is a Dutch term. It, it means hunting, um, and from that uh, the term yacht um, was introduced because of small and fast vessels. And of course, size matters. Um, small boats are up to seven meters. Yachts are already over 10 meters. Uh, if you have a super yacht, then you're bigger than 24 meters um, or, or 79 feet. Uh, it's already equipped with uh, some kind of GSM, Wi-Fi, internet stuff, and so on. And uh, mega yachts, uh, you can say it's a swimming IoT device uh, because of you have already uh, smart TVs, uh, smart home equipment, uh, ICS stuff in the propulsion units, and so on. Um, just a small picture about one of uh, the super yachts. So this is a picture of a um, TV star from Germany and his yacht. Um, but we will see information about it later. So why swimming IoT? Because we have um, so many different systems on board that, uh, yeah, vessel traffic services. We have automatic identification system. We have an autopilot somehow. Uh, GPS, radar system, cameras, uh, thermal imaging. Um, we have engine control units and monitoring devices. We have internet access and we have a couple of um, entertainment systems. I know for example from a um, 72 meter yacht they have 50 smart TVs on board. 50 and more than 150 uh, uh, connected devices on the network only for getting their uh, stuff uh, like at home. Um, yeah, for the maritime stuff, um, most of the things are connected uh, with an Anamia bus. The, the Anamia bus, it's somehow, an, in the past it was a uh, serial bus, 
and it's called NMEA 0183. So here we have one of those things. And um, when we, in modern yachts now we have NMEA 2000. And NMEA 2000 is uh, nothing less than an, like a CAN bus in the car. So we have some terminators here, this is the CAN bus and everything is connected um, to the bus system. So when we have connection to the, tra uh, to the bus here, like here we have a gateway from uh, that turns uh, the, the signals from the CAN bus to your computer. Or it is directly connected then to the network and some other computers. So that's how everything is connected together. So the cabling is a little bit easy. Um, I'm not sure if you have seen it in the exhibit on the um, on the CTF. There were some pictures. All, uh, you can see it also there. But it looks like these old um, ten base T connectors from the past, when, where the people have dealt with uh, the cheaper net and B and C cabling. So it looks like that, but it's a little bit different. Yeah, in the past, the Anemia 0183 from the National Marine Electronic Association, um, it was a serial bus with 4,800 baud speed. Not that much, but it was much enough uh, for echo sounders, sonars, uh, anemometers, gyro compass, autopilots, and GPS, and some other stuff. Um, whatever your sensors you have there. So the speed was not enough, so then they introduced uh, the CAN bus part and called it Anemia 2000. Um, here we have now one megabit um, network bandwidth, what we can use. Um, yeah, it's electrically the same as uh, the CAN bus in the automobile industry, but um, you have different connectors for that. Um, and it's not electrically compatible with the uh, old standard, so there you have some uh, converters for that. And because the speed was not enough, uh, then they introduced uh, newer standards. Uh, Ray Marine called it, for example, SeaTalk Next Generation. That's why it NG. And uh, there is also, uh, this one has already 10 megabit. Um, and there, there is a SeaTalk uh, HS, uh, high speed, uh, HS. Um, there you have already 100 megabit on speed on the bus system. So. When you look here at the pictures, these are most of the stuff for the navigation part. Uh, and some of the points that I trigger on is, here is um, the receiver and the sender for the autopilot system. Here we have the GPS receiver. And all those information go into the bus system and then spread it to all the devices who are interested in the information. So. Some of the systems are used um, as a traf uh, vessel traffic service. So it's some kind of, an, um, yeah, you can say it's similar to the air, uh, aircraft, uh, aircraft um, control system where they, uh, yeah, air traffic control, you can say. It's similar to that. Uh, it's used mostly in harbors where they um, get the information about the system or, or the ship and put it in the right place. Um, it's using radar, CCTV, uh, VHF radio uh, communication and uh, the AIS system. Um, the AIS system, it's uh, pretty easy. You have it on most ships uh, from a uh, specific size on. Um, then it's mandatory and um, the most of the system are working on VHF, um, we see it later, or there's also a satellite version of that. Um, so the AIS um, supplements and the radar system and um, get also the information from that. So it's some kind of collision avoidance that you can look up for that. So the AIS using the GPS information from the CAN bus, uh, from the Anamia network, to be correct. Then we have an Actis, uh, the electronic chart display and information system. So this is some kind of an uh, electronic version about your C cards. So in the part you have a paper printout of the uh, C cards where you travel on. And um, you don't have to have it now unless you have two, sim uh, two different GPS devices and then you can completely rely on those actors on these electronic versions. So the thing is then, all the information that the actors get uh, about the position, it's uh, getting from the AIS and also from the GPS system on the uh, NMEA bus system. 
and then we have some kind of IT equipment on board. Um, anyhow, we have to have internet access. So it's done by GSM or Wi-Fi or satellite dishes um, where you can um, access the internet on the high sea. Um, and on board, we have a couple of um, IT systems also, entertainment system, voice over IP. I've seen a couple of things, Wi-Fi for the guests, for the crew, for the, uh, for the owner of the ship, and so on. Um, this, for example, is a picture of a 40-meter uh, yacht with a 90-inch rack full of IT stuff. To just show it a little bit, it's an uh, internet router where you have your access. Here are three servers to get all the things controlled. We have two voice over IP gateways there and a completely full stacked um, network switch with eight, 48 ports and some kind of uninter uninterrupted power supply. And uh, the other things we have on board are 10 smart TVs, one chart PC, uh, the Actis, 14 voice over IP telephones on the network, the internet router uh, and four access points for Wi-Fi. As I mentioned, uh, in front of it, the 72-meter yacht um, that I've seen has 24 access points on the ship to have a whole coverage of uh, Wi-Fi. So, 24 already. Um, who is patching that shit? <laughs> we will see. <laughs> That's a big story. Um, and the ships are going more and more to be smart ships. So, as you can see here, only a, small, uh, a few pictures about you can control with your uh, tablet, you can control the light, you can control the electric curtains of the ship, you have um, monitoring access or also um, other access to uh, the rudder information, the RPM of the engine, uh, the oil stand and so on. Um, so all the information you can access via your smart tablet tip. So with your smart TV, uh, your smart devices. Um, and you can also um, access those things um, remotely with your mobile phone. So this is then how a network on a ship looks like. So I'm putting everything together and um, yeah, it looks like a network uh, at home in your business, in your company, however. So starting at the top, we have some internet routers that we maybe can access or attack. The next uh, attack station, uh, situation we could have is uh, the computers on board. So they are connected to the network and through the internet. Another uh, attack vector could be uh, the mobile devices uh, the, of the crew, of the, um, of the guests and so on, that are connected over the Wi-Fi system to the network of the ship. And then, uh, when we have access maybe f uh, on the network of the ship, we have to look for the gateways that's going to the canvas. So here it is separated by these devices. It could be an, a USB device, it could also be an, a standalone device. And then we are now on the ship network, on the canvas of the ship, where we have access then to all other information. As you can see, the GPS, the engine, uh, AIS, radar, sonar, and so on and so on. So this is then the bus where we can access it. So the first thing we maybe can do is uh, we can spoof or fake the GPS information to get the ship maybe on a different course. Um, by the way, there are a couple of GPS systems today online. Um, we have uh, the US version, it was the first one that most of the people say GPS is GPS. But GPS is uh, the US version of the Global Navigation Satellite System. Um, the Russians using their GLONASS system, uh, the Europeans their Galileo. It's not fully operatable now and uh, two weeks ago they had a big issue with their system. So they fucked up the atomic clock uh, synchronization. So, um, I don't know, has someone heard about that? That the Galileo system was more than one week not working? Of the what? No, it was uh, no, no, it wasn't. Um, I read a report about that. Um, so the problem was the satellites uh, are, have atomic clocks inside um, for correct um, timing. So 
these uh, atomic clocks are synchronized to the ground station. Uh, and for the Galileo system, we have two ground stations. One is in Germany, one is in Switzerland. So, and they are uh, maintained by two different companies. So the German ones is a different company than the Switzerland ones. So the problem was then, um, the German had a, a normal maintenance phase where they switched off the atomic clock in Germany. And at the same time, in Switzerland, somehow something happened with their system. Uh, so they have to, uh, so the clock drifted a little bit away and they have to shut down their system too. So both atomic clocks um, could not synchronize with the satellite uh, in the air. And uh, the satellite then decided, okay, I have no synchronate, uh, synchronated clock now. We switch off our operation. So, and then uh, all the satellites, uh, all the 24 satellites for the Galileo were then uh, switched off and uh, get, get not um, any more a correct position about that. It took them more than one week uh, to recover all the synchronization to the system and now it is working again. Yeah, only a, a small story about that. Um, yeah. When we look at the frequencies, you can see uh, we have three bands where all the systems are working on and um, all, all privately uh, used uh, devices for that are working on the L1 band. And then you have only uh, a couple of frequencies uh, where all of the systems are working on. It's not that much. So the scenarios could be then uh, we can spoof the signal or we can jam it. Jamming is very easy. Um, you just have to have a uh, software radio, um, software defined radio device that can transmit something and then you can uh, jam the signal um, or using some other stuff. Spoofing is a little bit difficult but you can also do it um, with equipment uh, starting about 350 euro, uh, 400 bucks for example. Um, yeah, Jamming happens quite often. Every time when the military is doing a military exercise, you will see somehow uh, GPS interferences, um, anomalies, and so on. Um, especially when the Russians um, doing their exercises, they jam the GPS all the time. Um, there's also a link here uh, to a report from an, uh, from 2017, where more than 20. Uh, 20 ships and some aircrafts uh, reported anomalies in their system. Um, yeah, for jamming, it's not really. Uh, yeah, by the way, the U.S. Navy teaching again navigation with a sixth end, so they stopped somehow teaching that. And after they figured out uh, a couple of years ago that it is not maybe a good idea only to rely on GPS information, we should be able also to navigate in a traditional way. And uh, the first uh, Navy officers uh, trained again on that, come to Germany and get trained on the system again, how to navigate with the six hand, just to know about. Um, GPS jammers you can buy online, uh, for example, at celljammers.com. Um, it's starting from, yeah, these are the little bit expensive one. And you can also have small USB devices uh, for 80 bucks and also for the c uh, cigarette lighter in your car. So when you maybe are thinking about someone has a GPS tracker on your car, take this uh, cigarette lighter version and then uh, your GPS tracker in the car is not working anymore. Um, yeah, For professional testing you can have also these uh, GNS simulators. They're quite expensive. Um, this one is around 15,000 euro. But then you can simulate all the things that uh, a real satellite uh, navigation system is doing. You can uh, replay waypoints uh, and so on. Um, we had used one for our devices that we are uh, using in our company. So for, for the pipeline tracking, we have also some GPS trackers that we build our own. And uh, to test them, we're using such kind of device. Um, but yeah, it's very expensive, but uh, maybe it's a little bit easier to fake the GPS signals on the NMEA bus. So then we come to the spoofing. So spoofing is a little bit, nah, it's not really difficult. You need only the right tools. For example, buy an HEC RF, have the right antenna in place, 
and you need some scripts for that and that's it. Or you can also use a uh, Blade RF, it's a little bit more powerful and then you can uh, gamble with that. Um, just a small advice, don't mess with the GPS signals, uh, you may disturb some others. Use a forensic bag or a um, Faraday cage uh, where you can uh, set up your lab for that. Um, yeah, For spoofing the signals, you need a software-defined radio and you need to write a software for that. So the software you can uh, download on GitHub, um, it's a GPS SDR simulator and with that you can already do all what you want. Um, one thing you need for that is, um, once you have all your equipment in place, you need to have the daily download of the uh, constellation of the satellites in the air. So that you can download from the uh, FTP side of the NASA. Um, and then you have to uh, calculate your daily um, daily, uh, yeah, daily file about that. And then with the information that you want to spoof, you put everything in place, you compile a new um, script for that, and then you transmit it with the software-defined radio devices. So these are the few commands that you then need. Um, as you can see, uh, you set this frequency on the device that you need. Uh, you need the right sample rate and bandwidth, um, the gain for that, and uh, below you can see that there is, um, this is then the bin file that we use with, with the information of the GPS signals that we want to spoof. And then you send uh, the file over the device and you're done. Um, some drawbacks are there. Uh, you have to have the right uh, gain of the signal. So if your signal is too strong, maybe uh, the devices are not accepting yours because uh, some devices are detecting, okay, there is now another signal with an, uh, with an higher gain. Um, we ignore that. So, but somehow it works. Another thing, um, when we have access to the NMEA bus, we can maybe uh, use different things. So this is a uh, software uh, from At yeah, ATL Soft. It's a GPS simulator. Here you can see uh, it's connected to the uh, NMEA 01A3 bus. It's uh, with a COM port connected. And then you can set your information to what uh, latitude and longitude you want and then press the start button and then it sends out the NMEA uh, data on the bus with the fake GPS signals. So if you have somehow access, for example, to the bus by renting a uh, yacht, you maybe have them uh, when you have enough time and uh, access the system, you can put some fishy, spoofy devices in the ship and then can do some stuff with it later. Um, yeah. So now, how we can protect for that? Um, this is a uh, research project in Germany. They using a four by no, two by two antenna device. So here is the antenna. It's an array of about uh, four antennas. It's uh, and then you here see the radio signal about that. And by the four antennas, you can already calculate. Okay, the signal is maybe coming from the side, or it's coming from the right position from the top. Um, with that, you easily can see uh, if it is a spoof signal coming from the side or is it an original one from the top. And um, another thing that is possible with this, um, it can filter out the spoof signal and amplify the uh, original one. So it's, it's still in a test phase, it's, uh, it is working and uh, I think we will see it in a couple of years um, as a normal device. And I have also found you can buy now a GPS firewall. Sounds like a bit, li little bit like snake oil, um, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's a device that you can buy. Um, maybe it's working like uh, the same as um, the research project on the Germans, um, because it's connected between the GPS antenna, the device, and uh, it doing them some stuff. Anyhow, if I have uh, the chance to get one of those devices to test, uh, I will do it and um, put it in later. Have someone, maybe one? Uh, I don't know. 
if yes, uh, contact me, please. Okay, um, yeah, AIS system. AIS using the GPS information that I already mentioned and sends them over its own device, uh, over their own system, the information back to another world, uh, thing. Um, every ten to, uh, two to ten seconds, uh, they're sending messages when the ship is on the way. Uh, for example, the status, I'm on anchor, or I'm, I'm on the way, on the motor, my speed, uh, my heading, uh, my course over ground, uh, and so on. And the system is quite easy. It is working on a VHF radio, 161 MHz uh, and 162 MHz, or just two, uh, two channels that you need. The encoding is also very easy, uh, and with those informations and with your software-defined radio, you can receive your own AIS system. Um, just use a uh, software-defined radio device like the HackRF, download uh, the scripts for GNU AIS, and you can receive your own. Your own. And when you change some kind of uh, those GNU radio stuff, then you can also transmit different systems. So. When you change it a little bit, you are able to transmit fake AIS information and it shows then uh, on every other system uh, on the world to the AIS uh, devices. Another one is um, the autopilot I have already mentioned about. So um, I'm still on the research phase of that. So in September I have access again to one of those systems and then, then I can uh, record the radio signals and uh, get more uh, in my research for that. So how it is working? It's a handheld radio controlled and then the, on the right you see the receiver for that. Um, in this case it was a Raymarine S100 wireless device and you can uh, put in some new um, heading and uh, speed information. So you put in those information, say, okay, new, uh, this is my new course and speed. It sends then to the autopilot system and the ship is then following that. Uh, mostly you find it on sailing yachts, uh, but this was also on a uh, normal motor yacht. Um, yeah, how you look at that stuff, um, every device that is um, sending, uh, transmitting radio signals must be uh, registered at the FCC. So the, um, and then you can also look up at the FCC ID. There's search options where you can uh, figure out what it is. Um, I've done it here in the picture. It's a, the uh, the granted code. It's called PG5, and it's it's a smart device. Mikko Hypenen said once, when a, a device is smart, you can hack it. Um, just <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, okay. When you read then the documentation there. Um, you figure out, okay, it's some kind of an autopilot system and it is working on uh, 2.45 gigahertz. And it's not Wi-Fi, so it's somehow something else. And there are other information about that you can find. So this is then also the information that you can get on the FCC ID website, uh, how the system is working. So there is some kind of a processor, a network processor, and an RF transceiver. Um, it's an Amiga microprocessor, and they're running their own uh, Ember Stack wireless protocol on that. So with that information, you have already everything that you needed uh, to figure out how maybe the RF signals uh, are looking like. So I think I have an update on that uh, in October this year. Now we're coming on uh, how to hack the internet connections. So when I started with that, I had access to these, uh, yeah, the Locomarine Yacht Router. So, that very nice uh, device. It's looking like this. Um, it has a Wi Fi booster with 1.6 watt uh, electrical uh, energy. And with the right antenna, uh, I had uh, on the Monkey Island around 20, 25 watt AERP uh, sending power. It's very high. And uh, they claim to have. Wi-Fi at least at 15 nautical miles and a uh, mobile phone should be working up to 30 nautical miles. I was not able to test it uh, because I always only on the yacht when it is in the harbor. Um, 
yeah, some drawbacks. <laughs> but yeah, um, when I looked at then how the system is working, um, they have a nice uh, software for that. You can install it on your computer, you can install it on your mobile phone, on your tablet, whatever. Um, so this is then uh, an overview about the complete things that you can do. So navigation, um, the, these are the different Wi-Fi systems that they have, uh, access to other systems, uh, surveillance uh, and so on. Um, yeah, you can also access your multimedia devices and this is all done over this control panel. So then I um, looked up how this uh, software was working and it figured out the software connects via FTP to the router. That's the first thing. So FTP, okay, FTP is clear text. Then it downloads an XML file. When you change something in the software, you, you change it uh, on your tablet, for example, then you modify it, and later on when you say save, it sends them back the XML file to the router, and then uh, restart it. Um, yeah, there. As you know, FTP is clear text. Uh, the first thing I thought, okay, they're using anonymous authentication, so that means nothing, uh, or they're using hard-coded credential, what could be uh, even worse stuff. So, in this case, it figured out they're using um, hard-coded credentials. So the username was Loco. Loco is a Spanish word for mad. And uh, I love the password, secure connecting user. Wow. Um, yeah, some... Uh, some things of that. So then I downloaded again the software and um, looked up what it is. So it's an, uh, in this case it's a um, .NET application. Then I used a tool like ILSpy where you can uh, reanalyze the source code about that and in, then you find uh, a couple of juicy information inside of the software. For example, one of those developers, um, somehow John, I don't know who is it. Jerry is one of the developers uh, from the company. Um, some other information that. And when you find the Yacht Router engine, there you find a complete configuration about, okay, username, password, IP address of the internal server, um, the name of the XML file, uh, some information about uh, the Wi-Fi, uh, the Wi-Fi names, the passwords for the Wi-Fi, and so on. Um, so, okay. First thought, they're using it only internally. Let's look up how it looks like from the internet. So I did an in-map scan on the, IP, uh, on the public IP address after the device is online, and these are then the open ports. So what? We have hard-coded credentials, and the FTP port is open to the internet. So you can de access that device anyhow when it is online uh, with those hard-coded credentials. Um, and, some other uh, and some other ports also. This one is very nice, we see it later. Um, yeah. Then another thing is uh, in this software, they have some remote support. This is from the documentation. Um, so when you read it, you will find out uh, you don't have to send them an IP address. If you uh, need a remote um, support from them, you have only to say, okay, this is my serial number of my device, and this is the time when you can access it. That's it. How they know that? Uh, they need an IP address for that. So it, it turns out that they make a ping back to their systems. So this is the IP address of their devices and it's belonging to Locomarine. So every time when the device is online, they knew your IP addresses when you're online. So on privacy reason, uh, it's also not so fine. Okay, then how can they access then? So yeah, okay, they know the, uh, the hard-coded credential of the FTP, but it turns out they're using then uh, the Microtech um, Winbox management software. So it's running on port 8291 TCP and uh, it's a very nice software. With this management software, um, you can do much more than in the normal software of the device. Um, you can also change uh, the Wi Fi settings and there is also, I'm not seeing it here now, but I have a picture here. You have access to the user list. 
these are the credentials that are then intern, uh, so the user local, we already know, but there's another one, Jera. So Jera has always access to the device when it is online. And he knows every time when it is online. So if this is a good idea, I don't know. Um, yeah. Um, after I reported it, they may change it. Um, I have to look up later. So they promised they have a new device now online. And, uh, and they promised to send me an, a new sample of that. Um, I'm waiting for that. If you're not familiar with uh, looking up the stuff with IL Spy deco uh, decompiling software, you can also use um, tools like MKBrutos, mm, where you can attack MikroTik uh, router devices. So it does done everything for you. For example, there's a small Python script. Um, you only need uh, the Python script and the IP addresses, and it gives you then back the username and the password for that. Uh, very easy. Um, yeah, I reported the things to the vendor. Um, two bucks they fixed. Uh, the other one take a little bit longer. They gave out a new software about that, and then they patched it. Uh, I received my CVE for that. Um, yeah, and then I looked up the patched software that they gave. So they changed now FTP to SSH. That's already a good version. And then I was thinking, okay, hmm. yeah, and they're still using um, hard coded credentials. Um, the other thing that they did, um, obfuscation. They obfuscated their software so that you not easily can decode it, but with a little bit uh, more time investment, uh, it's also not that bad. So maybe it takes an hour more longer yet. Um, it's not that hard. Uh, yeah, this is then uh, the normal crash of, of your decompiler. Um, so it has some errors then. Um, in that case, okay, I'd struggle at that point, uh, so I downloaded the Android version of the software. It's also a .NET application, and they forget about it. So they um, obfuscated the Windows version, but forgot about the Android version, and uh, it's still a uh, normal version about that. So it's not obfuscated. So when you then look at the same uh, classes for the software, the Yotter Router Engine, you find there is now a, the same user with a new password. It's a complex one, yeah, but it's still hard-coded. And it's still accessible over uh, SSH now. Um, yeah. So that's the last point of those things. Um, and yeah, I'm waiting for the new hardware of them. Um, yeah, some other information you can find there. Uh, patch Backbone Data Leak. Uh, it's a nice class. Yeah, it's looking fancy. And uh, yeah, all the other information, like IP addresses from the internal network and so on. Um, yeah, that I was, uh, said already. SSH instead of FTP now. Um, they obfuscated the uh, DLL in the Windows version, but not in the Android. Uh, the iPhone version, I don't know. Uh, I had no way to test it. Still using hard-coded credentials. Uh, that's not good. Um, and. The, uh, SSH and um, Winbox is still reachable over the internet when the device is online. So the firewall scripts are not set up that correctly. So coming to the last point now, uh, you can have on the high sea also access over satellite. So because Wi-Fi coverage is uh, very bad when you're a thousand miles away on the high sea, so you need how to communicate over internet uh, to the internet over satellite systems. So. While, while I was looking up some of those local marine systems, um, I struggled yeah, a little bit on Shodan and find uh, some other nice devices. So, yeah, uh, that I already said. Um, you can look up in Shodan for those devices. These are uh, some of the search string where you can look for. Um, these are all things that uh, other people have already find out uh, with vulnerabilities and uh, therefore you use uh, the search strings here and um, yeah Shodan has also a ship tracker um, for the VZ uh, SATCOM devices so ship tracker dot and then you can look up all the devices that are online uh, so yeah they're using VZ and so on um, yeah in my point I was looking for those local marine devices and I found some 
names that called stabilized digital antenna system. So, wow, that sounds good. Um, I want to know more about that. So I looked up in Sholan a little bit more, um, and then it uh, claimed that, okay, there's a Copam MXP web server. Um, with the easy uh, search string, the micro digital web server, it gives you a better result. You find those devices. Um, yeah, this is then how it looks like in uh, Shodan. Um, at that point, uh, we had 21 devices online, and uh, this is the device that you find then. Um, yeah. Then I looked up. Um, yeah, the first thing that I do, I show it. I show it later. It's it's more fun then. In general. This is how the device is working. Um, the ICU and antenna device is on top of your ship. And uh, below then you have the computer and the MXP web server uh, that's controlling those things. Um, that's the point where we switch to the demo. And the internet is still running. Okay, here we have Showdown. Um, I have already put in here the search string, uh, micro digital web server I'm looking for. Today we have 16 devices online, a couple of here in the US. Um, I don't care where they are, uh, just take the first one. Oh, no. Ah, come on. I need to lock on, that's bad. Oh no, here we go. Oh, that's a very old one. It doesn't matter. Hopefully it is online. Yeah, here we go. It's a little bit slow because it's over satellite. And now we have the web interface of a ship live in the internet. Um, yeah, I can uh, now use the username and password to log in. I don't have one. Uh, so we have to find another way. So the first thing that I did was right click source code that's it and then the first thing that uh, paid my attention was this part here uh, hopefully you can see it javascript uh, user login .js. so let's click on it and this is then the login script for that um, if we scroll now a little bit down dun -dun 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 uh, here are the funny places. If the login username is dealer, then use the menu dealer gx.html. If the login is user, then use another one. So, okay, what we do to hack the system, it's very easy. We copy the URL. And the funny thing is, It's working. It takes now a little bit of time, and now I have admin access to that device. It, it's switching now back um, after a couple of seconds because uh, I have to set also a referrer information that uh, the thing is uh, always there. But here's some kind of a ship, and we have here uh, latitude and longitude information and the name for that. If we look now um, marinatraffic.com, we can easily, uh, we can, yeah, we can try it. 41.25 and 9.43. Uh, okay, let's look marinatraffic.com to see if it is the right ship. Meridiana. Okay, here's one. It could be maybe this. Dun, dun, dun. It looks good. Let's look at the information. Okay, here, actual position of the ship is 41.25 latitude and 9.43 longitude. Come on. And here in my system, it's the same information. It's that ship. 
Um, it's actual laying in, uh, yeah, I don't know, five minutes ago, last position. Um, it is moored, engine is stopped. Uh, yeah, it's anyhow laying in a harbor, I think. Uh, it's a nice yacht. Okay. So now we have access to that device. Uh, we can see also some other things here. Uh, command line interface. I can change the position of the antenna information. So I can reconfigure the information about how the antenna is accessing uh, the internet and so on. Um, yeah. Dum -dum -dum. That's, that's from that part. Switching back to the... Dum -dum -dum. Okay. So the demo I gave. Um, yeah. In short, a review. If the username is dealer, then you have ad, uh, admin access. If the user is user, then you have a little bit uh, less information. Here are some uh, pictures of the software. Um, yeah, as I already said, a command line interface. From that point, you can then dig for other devices in your uh, in the network of the ship. Uh, looking, for example, for the TCP/IP converter to NMEA signals and uh, spoof your information uh, on the ship. From that, yeah, from the internet to uh, the Anamia system, it's not a big problem anymore. Or you can also make some firmware upgrades and so on. Um, or you also can try to use the default credentials from the documentation. When you, look the hand, uh, when you read the handbook, um, the username is dealer and the password is CTL3 and so on. Uh, it's not a big deal. Yeah, someone found it already before me uh, when I looked it up, uh, but he only claimed uh, the version 121 is vulnerable. So I tested all the versions uh, listed here down uh, and they are vulnerable to the same thing. Um, I also contacted then um, the vendor because I found something different that I will explain now. Um, yeah some kind of the web pages that you can access without authentication, um, where you have all the things. Um, yeah. You can increase uh, the cost by just uploading, downloading software uh, or doing other stuff, or you can uh, switch off the internet connection on high C. That is maybe a bad idea, uh, but it's also then uh, bad for the uh, the crew on on board they have no internet access anymore and uh, get no information anymore so yeah another thing that I found then was um, there was an other issue in this device so when you send two specific parameters to the web device it created then a complete backup of the configuration and put it in a temp folder of the web server and as we know, we don't need an authentication. We download the configuration file, and we have then uh, all the information about the system with the configuration, the username, password, and so on. So here you see my test script that I've written for that. Um, and then this is then a, a short overview about what you, uh, information you can download then later. So it's then in a temp folder uh, in a configuration file where you can find everything. So, yeah, coming to the last parts now, um, the engine control units are also connected to the network. Um, and then uh, I think Brian Olsen has already uh, covered it in his talk, um, where he figured out that some kind of the auto-masking engine control units that are connected to the, web, uh, to the network have some drawbacks where you can bypass also the authentication and have control over the engines. So yeah, then you can say, okay, engine left, full, uh, full speed ahead, and the other ones in the other direction. Um, as you can see here also, um, it's connected to the network and also using uh, some industrial protocols like Modbus or something else. Um, yeah. The future is maybe it coming more and more autonomous. So autonomous ships need some kind of internet connection and using GPS information. Um, yeah. For that, we have to be clear that then uh, the system should be protected very good. So this we can skip. Yeah, autonomous ships. 
there are already things going on. So Rolls-Royce tested 2017 the first voyage of an autonomous ship. So a captain was still on board just for backup. But the main control of the ship was done uh, in the harbor from a control room. It was not really autonomous, but uh, let's say more or less remote controlled. If they remote, uh, can remote control it, someone else maybe can also control it. So that's because of maybe they're using the same uh, weak internet devices. So yeah, what's next? Um, we need to test more and more on the NMEA. Um, the NMEA should be uh, a protocol should be have more security, uh, security uh, authenticating and so on in place so that uh, nobody can tamper the signals that are um, put on the uh, yeah on the bus. The wireless auto uh, autopilot I'm working on. Um, so all those other internet uh, things has to be tested. Um, so a couple of us are working on it, but uh, we need more time for that to figure out all those devices. Um, and it becomes more and more that all the devices are connected to the cloud anyhow. So um, here we see one of those things um, where they are using now, um, yeah, for example, this from Mariton. This part we had already in my uh, network design. And here everything is connected also to the cloud where you can access then all the devices over your tablet, smartphone or your uh, laptop. So you have no full access from anyhow to your ship. So I know sure if someone has already tested these cloud services, but uh, yeah, when I have time, I will do it. So this then, again, one of those things uh, where you have remote control about that. Uh, yeah, rudder information, RPM, oil temperature, and whatever. Yeah, coming to the end, Anamia Gateway also needs more tested. Satcom boxes mostly unpatched. Uh, the problem is they have only a small window where they have time to patch those things. So most, more, more or less, they are running uh, all the time. And once a year, or maybe uh, once or two years, they're coming in the harbor, in the yard, uh, and then there is only time to patch the things. So in between, the ships are vulnerable if there is something is found. So the, uh, the vessel transport services needs all to be tested more and more. Um, autopilot, I'm working on it. Injecting NMEA messages. Um, some other people are also testing with that. GPS spoofing, um, yeah, it's some fun. Um, but uh, yeah, I think the first devices we will see to protect that system. Coming to the last slide now. May the force be with you. My Twitter handle, my email address, if you want to contact me. You can also speak after me, uh, with me a little bit. I cannot give out some business cards. I lost everyone. Uh, I run out of business cards. So uh, yeah, you have to take my email address and contact me for that. Thank you for joining uh, and have a fun, uh, have a nice rest, DEFCON.